First, it's a local dispute with big implications. At a meeting late last Thursday night, councillors approved the first of three planning applications, which will double the size of the Magna Park freight hub near Lutterworth. As we reported last week, there's strong opposition locally, but others say it could bring thousands of new jobs. And Mark, it's this classic clash, really, isn't it, between development and lots of new jobs. Which would you go for in Sherwood? Would you welcome a development on this scale? Well, I am pushing like mad actually for an enterprise zone at Thorsby Colliery. I think uh, that the real challenge, though, is to make sure you get those sorts of development with the right infrastructure in place so that you don't completely gridlock your constituency in the process. So if you can get the infrastructure right, you can get good rail links in and out, good road links, then actually they're a really good thing for, for my community. And that's crucial, isn't it? Because that part of Leicestershire has almost uh, zero unemployment, but people from outside the area would really welcome those jobs. People from Derby mm. South, for example, would, would welcome going up the M1 to work there. I think one of the things we really have to try and do is to make sure we can get the maximum opportunities for employment and also preferably for the right kind of employment. Uh, I mean, we're very keen in Derby. We're, we're looking for investment and getting investment uh, to, to expand in high skill, high value jobs with good wages mm. and conditions. Um, you know, this is what we need and uh, you feel sorry for people who feel, you know, we don't need it quite in this patch. But for the country as a whole, it's got to be the way to go. Okay, well the councillors have told us that they have no choice, Mark, but to approve this. It doesn't break any guidelines and it would be illegal for them to turn it down. So much for local decision making, really. Yeah, and I, I mean, I do recognise that. But of course, you have to also recognise that they're in that perfect triangle between the M69 and the, the M6 and the M1. So really good links. And for the Midlands, for the East Midlands, we need to exploit our, our geographical position and, and push for as many jobs as we can. Because there are still people out there that are desperate for work. OK. Well, it's been one of the big topics of the political year so far. The publication of a report by our guest, Margaret Beckett, into why the Labour Party lost the last election and the lessons to be learned. But what does it mean here in the East Midlands? Our political editor, Tony Rowe, has been meeting the voters, the report says, are deserting Labour on new housing estates in former mining towns and lifelong supporters in Leicester's black community. Labour have always been seen as the party for Britain's black and Asian communities. Not anymore. I kind of even in the last election saw myself as kind of like a red Tory, which sounds really weird because a lot of what the Tories were saying made a lot more sense than what Ed Miliband was saying. I feel slightly embarrassed actually to even say that I, I did um, vote Conservative because probably I think that I, I'm supposed to vote Labour. The sense of alarm and of resentment. Tory Enoch Powell fueled the fear of immigration in the 60s. Norman Tebbit had his cricket test in the 80s. Which country do you support, he asked. Uncomfortable for immigrant communities, sending them to Labour's open arms. And for many years, people obviously saw the Tory party as this racist party because, you know, when they were writing things on the, on the walls like, if you want a N-word for a neighbour, then vote Labour. So I think a lot of these stereotypes stuck in people's heads for many, many years. But what we're saying now is we've entered into a time where those barriers are now being broken down. Increased social mobility perhaps means the reason for Labour's lost voters is more to do with aspiration than race. Like in this Nottinghamshire mining town with no pits anymore and lots of new homes. This is Hucknall in the Sherwood constituency, normally a bellwether seat swinging between Labour and Conservative at general elections. At the last election, Labour were hoping to win here. Their vote fell. It's always been a Labour stronghold town, but let's not forget that this town has, all town has, has, has grown. There's a lot of private estates on in Up and there's a lot of people that's moved here. My mum, she was going to vote Labour, but it was all about the immigrants and stuff like that that she didn't like. So that's why I think most people didn't. Could be the actual leader, Miliband, at the time very undecisive. Yeah, that's what I think personally. So you but think the one now is even worse. No. Do you think people will vote Labour at the next election with Jeremy Corbyn in charge? A lot's joined him and my family's joined him, so they probably will. If they have the right policies, people will vote for them and if they have the confidence, people will vote for what they believe in, won't they? We also try to do that time-honoured political practice of door-knocking to canvas more opinion. So we don't want to talk about it? No. OK. All right. Thank you. Cheers. On a cold day, 
it must be very dispiriting sometimes. I think we have a problem here, and that is people don't really want to talk about politics. The people we've spoken to don't want to vote. And they're all much of a muchness to me, the parties, so no, that's why I didn't vote. Whether it's blaming Tory myths and media portrayal, or the leadership, welfare, immigration and economic competence, Labour has a big job to do to turn it around. And you can see that discussion between voters at Leicester's Highfield Rangers Club in full on our social media site. Search for Sunday Politics East Midlands on Facebook, Twitter or YouTube. So Margaret Beckett, are you worried to see those voters in Leicester there who aren't automatically now voting for Labour? Always, but then uh, I have to admit, it's never seemed to me that you should automatically assume any group of voters are going to vote for your party, and that applies across the board. But it's clear that they're the turning parties. away from Labour. Yes, well, at the last election, as we all know, many people did, and, and it's a great disappointment. And I think in some ways, to me, the most disheart almost heartbreaking thing is when you listen to people who you know will be badly affected by the policies that... Um, you know, the present government is likely to, or whoever the government is, uh, who say, oh, I'm not going to bother to vote or I didn't bother to vote because I don't think it makes any difference. And you know the enormous difference it's going to make to their lives. That's heartbreaking, but that's a task of political education, political communication that we have to overcome. Mark Spencer, Conservatives did well on votes from the BME community. You got a third of the vote there. Still a long way to go though, and clearly you, you heard some people in our film there saying that they were actually embarrassed to say that they, they voted Conservative. Yeah, which is, which, yeah, and quite, I mean a third is frankly not good enough, we need to do much better than that, but uh, you know, I think actually it's about policies, it's about making sure you genuinely represent those people and you do what you think is right for those communities, and I think that's where the Labour Party went wrong, they took people for granted, and it's still happening locally, you know, I think the Conservative Party has shown itself to be working very hard on behalf of communities right at, through all levels, at district council level, right through to uh, Westminster, and people actually understand that and they'll support it. Did you take voters for granted, Margaret Beckett? No. Um, no, we didn't, but uh, I think and one of the issues that was addressed in my report is that the information that we were all getting from opinion polling was actually very misleading. Um, so without taking anybody for granted, I think that it would have been better if we'd had a clearer idea so of what, where we all stood. So what did go wrong? What, in terms of why we lost or yes. why the opinion polls were wrong? No, why you lost. We couldn't, we knew we had to try and rebuild trust on the economy and on really difficult, contentious issues where I'm afraid Mark's party has deliberately tried to, to divide people, like immigration, like welfare. We knew that we had to try and get people's confidence on those issues and we didn't manage to do it and on that's the, why we lost. On the stuff that head. really matters, on the stuff that really affects people's lives, I mean even locally today I've got Ashfield District Council who are going to change the way in which they, they deal with Ashfield homes, they're going to take it in house uh, and frankly they won't consult, they won't listen to their tenants, they're just taking them for granted, they're going to swap everybody's dustbin, they're going to spend £1.4 million pounds on swapping people's dustbins and then they're going to cut services what, what? and people are looking at that, traditional labour are looking at and thinking you're not listening to me you're not taking my opinion on board and you're wasting my taxpayers money could that be because the council like every council in the country has lost massively as a result of your government's cuts? so why would you spend 1.4 million pounds swapping everybody's dustbin if you're going to reduce services it doesn't make any sense margaret and people are looking at that and they're saying that this is just completely wrong and you're not representing my community and you're not supporting are my they community. listening to local people Yes, and all councils are having to make, Tory and Labour alike, are having to make very, very difficult choices and decisions, and sometimes the balance of the way things work out. It isn't what people want them to do, but often they have no choice, and that's getting worse, not better. What about the criticisms uh, about your report? People have said it was watered down, particularly <laughs> criticism of, of Ed Miliband. Did he get to see the report? Did he ask for those changes? Was it watered down? No, I, I made one change in the final days, and that was because we had something in about what, what people un understood was a position, and, and it was factually incorrect. Were you trying so to be I kind to it. him? No, I... No, I was trying to be accurate. And yes, there's been, uh, am I surprised there's been criticism? No. There are people who didn't want to hear what we thought, because it wasn't just me, it was a task force. 
didn't want to hear the evidence that we were getting from right across the country and all kinds of people. They already knew what happened. They knew what they wanted okay. to hear. And if you didn't say it, they weren't going to be happy. What about Deborah Mattinson? She was a, a researcher who did some mm. work on that report. She said her findings were ignored. She said it was a whitewash. What well, I didn't see, that? I don't want to be unfair to Deborah, who I like and have a high regard for professionally, but the, the work, that, and we did take account of the work she did. Well, she uh, said that she found voters blamed Labour for the financial crisis and that they didn't trust them to run the economy. I know what she found. I heard her presentation. All I'm saying is she interviewed a very, very, very restricted group of people. She um, got some extravagant language from them. She came to quite extravagant conclusions. As a result, we did take heed of her evidence, but her evidence didn't reflect the bulk of the evidence we got across the country. And that's not to say there aren't important lessons we have to learn, because there certainly are. OK, let's leave that there. Now, there's a takeover battle going on in the East Midlands right now, but it's not between two companies, it's between two NHS trusts. The group which runs hospitals in Nottingham and the one that runs them in Derby are both vying to take over the troubled Sherwood Forest Trust, which is crippled by debt and is in special measures. So will it mean better facilities and improvements in care? Or will it lead to cuts and job losses? Here's our political reporter, Peter Saul. It's the same old rivalry. The trust that runs this hospital in Nottingham versus the trust that runs this one in Derby. The prize, if I can call it that, is this. A brand new hospital, yes, but the winner could be left drowning in debt with a PFI ultimately worth up to two and a half billion pounds. Both Nottingham and Derby think a takeover will mean some of that debt gets paid off by the government, but not everyone's convinced. I really can't see this going ahead because I think it would be suicidal on the part of the, the Nottingham Hospital Trust to, 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 to take it over without having some sort of copper-bottomed assurance on for finances. Whatever happens, the figures involved are enormous. Derby Teaching Hospitals Trust has 8,500 workers and an annual budget of £475 million. Nottingham University Hospitals employs 14,000 and has a turnover of £850 million. Meanwhile, Sherwood Forest Trust has 4,500 employees with a budget of £260 million. If Nottingham is successful in its takeover bid, it would create one of the biggest NHS trusts in England, employing 18,500 with a budget of more than a billion. So which trust is most likely to prevail? Nottingham has geography on its side and is already providing what it calls tactical support to Sherwood Forest. Derby, though, is on a sounder financial footing and the city's main hospital is highly thought of. I was in there with heart failure. They were marvellous, right from the cleaning lady up to the consultants, you know. So maybe they could teach Kings Mill a thing or exactly. two? Exactly. They could. I think they've got enough on the plate now, you know, with the, the people's coming from all over, all over the Midlands to this hospital now. I think that's one of the problems with parking and everything. Obviously the NHS, it's, it's UK-wide anyway, so I can't see it's going to make a massive difference to how Derby's run as a, as a rule. Both Kings Mill and Newark hospitals have been in special measures for nearly three years now, and the general feeling is that a larger trust area would give patients access to better treatment. The winning bid will be announced in a matter of weeks, but Sherwood Forest is not out of the woods yet. Well, we're joined now by Dr John Lamport, a former NHS doctor and now a member of the National Health Action Party. Thanks for joining right. us, John. Your reaction you. to this? Uh, it's interesting. Um, because what we're seeing is yet another paradigm shift in the way that the NHS is managed. Uh, so if you'll forgive me, first of all, we had the NHS, it was run and owned by the public exclusively, so it meant that we could directly intervene and say, right, well, this needs to be done this way. And we've benefited hugely from economies of scale. Then we moved on to this trust-based system, mm -hmm. and then we moved on to where the hospitals were sort of div divvied up into independent organisations, and we moved to foundation trust, foundation meaning the same as trust, so that's a bit Orwellian, it's trust, trust. Um, <laughs> Do you welcome it, the idea of it, the merger? Uh, cautiously. I don't think it's any worse than the previous system because what we're moving now to is chains of hospitals 
um, and then we can start to benefit a bit more from the economies of scale. Right, so, so there's some good things, some positives in it, potentially. Are. Mark Spencer, Kings Mill Hospital, of course, is the main hospital in your constituency. And you've said that this is really light at the end of the tunnel. How much, how much good news is there in this? Because we also heard in our film one person saying, without copper bottom assurances, it could be financial suicide. There well, are risks attached. Well, I think, um, well, I'd question that, frankly, because I think um, it can't get any worse than it's been in terms of the management of Sherwood Forest Hospital Trust. So, I, I, so this Nottingham, is the only way to go then? Nottingham Derby have both got really good track records actually of giving really top quality patient care and that's what my constituents uh, deserve and I think um, you know if we can make this happen then actually we're okay. going to get the level of service. And Nottingham we really East MP Chris Leslie says his principal concern here is whether a merger would be of benefit to Nottingham patients which is clearly your concern as you've just said. He wants reassurances from government uh, that government Government will be more will more than compensate Nottingham for the expense involved. Will that happen? Can you offer well, those assurances? I mean, I, I think he's right to recognise the financial challenge. It's pity he didn't recognise that when they were signing the PFI deal that under his government, which has put us into this mess. But uh, you know, I think uh, we we are going to need some cash to try and take the pressure off Sherwood Forest to allow Derby or Nottingham to really move forward. And that's certainly something I'm pushing for behind the scenes. Margaret Beckett, is it a good idea? I think there are there could be a lot of positives in it. Uh, I mean, one of the things that I'm very conscious of is that if you talk to the people involved, they're talking about partnerships, they're not talking about takeovers. They're talking about working together, as Mark said, to really improve the standard of patient care and to spread the benefits and perhaps to get some economies of scale. But it isn't just that. I mean, we have the medical school um, in Derby. We would like to expand that, to expand the research side and so on. So from our point of view, it would give opportunities to improve even further the service that we get in Derby. Is this empire building, though? No, I mean, no. What, what, we've, what we've had in, in Nottingham and in Derby is both of those trusts have been sending staff and resources and help to help Kingsmill for a long time because they do share a lot of the same sure. patients yes. anyway. What, but the problem is, when everything was divvied up into foundation trust, that was technically anti-competitive because they were operating almost as separate com companies. Right. Actually, now they can formally do this if we can say, right, it's not just a partnership, but it's part of the same organisation. Okay. It means we can get around some of those loopholes and start helping each other okay. a bit faster. But we, we also know in the world of business that when takeovers happen, job losses are never too far away behind them. Are the job losses likely as a result well, of this? I, I th the, the really insidious thing here is that we're creating a narrative that describes a hospital, a publicly owned service, as some sort of as some sort of company. Why would you want it to be profitable? That means that the nation is paying more to that hospital than is being spent on patient care. If you're left with a profit, you haven't spent all the money on your patients. I would much rather have a, a hospital that wants to spend as much as well, it can. Well, they're nowhere near as the situation of being in profit, are they? No, they're not, but that's a fault of the internal market, which we're moving away from, but it's being replaced by essentially an external market, which is possibly, arguably, worse. Um, can it's you rule so out job losses, well, Mark I, I think, Spencer? Uh, I mean, that's, that's a big concern, so, isn't so it? So, clearly, number one, there's going to be a loss of a chief exec, which I think is uh, not a negative thing. There'll be a loss of a board of trustees. It's all going to save money, which we can spend on doctors and nurses. I've been reassured that any admin roles will be absorbed and there won't be any compulsory redundancies. And actually, in the, in the general churn of jobs within those three big trusts, you could, you know, you could uh, not have compulsory redundancies. Mark, Mark's been blaming Labour for the problems here, Margaret. Oh, well, they always do. <laughs> um, but uh, going back to the real situation with these hospitals, my understanding is part of the problem Sherwood has had mm. is that they haven't been able to get the staff necessarily that they needed, that they've got vacancies mm. among the nursing staff, that they've got vacancies among the doctors, especially, to consultant, people there. especially in some specialties. Yes. And, and these are things where whichever way the partnership goes, mm. people can help each other out okay. and provide a better service this is, this is in the future. Saying, actually, there's lots of really hard-working, top-quality doctors and nurses within yeah. that Sherwood Forest Hospital oh, Trust. Yeah. And I yeah. hope this new deal will really sort of take some of the some of the negative stuff from around that hospital and, and get, them get a on real. With their yeah. it's, it's interesting to see to hear Mark criticise Labour for the PFI. Hasn't your government continued to sign PFI I mean, deals? There's, since there's nothing in wrong with ago. private finance initiative unless you get the deal as horrendously wrong as that one was and it is a shocker I tell you we have been right through it with a tooth comb. And, isn't and that it a is bit of a cop out because because you're not allowed to scrutinise at the moment PFI deals that are currently being because they're subject to 
it's you, difficult you, to get the information. So of course we can't scrutinise the ones that you've been signing. Absolutely. But what I would say is that you know there's nothing wrong with PFI in principle. I think actually they they can be a force for good. Can be. But if you get them wrong, they, why they're, is, they're horrendous. Why is PFI objectively better than national funding? What what does it gain? Well, I, I think it, it, we can, can borrow about two percent as a government Yeah, absolutely, bond. absolutely. And I, I think uh, you know there's there's lots of investments we can be making. But yeah. if the government is short of cash and you have private investors that are willing to come in and assist, but they're going then to be they can back the same. Absolutely, but as long as you get that deal right, then it can work. Okay, but, John you know, Lamport, thanks very much for coming in and doing my job very nicely for me. Thank you.